last year, but if you remember two years ago, we had a number of different uh, topic, um, events that talked about um, things like property taxes and why they were what they were, and uh, how the state government worked, how local governments work. Um, so this time, uh, we're coming back from our little sabbatical, and we're going to have an, uh, a presentation this evening by Perry Horowitz, who is executive director of the Office of Legislative Services for the state legislature in New Jersey. And as head of the OLS, uh, Ms. Horowitz directs staff in performing a number of administrative and, uh, well, I should say a number of uh, administrative functions for the state legislature, and she's going to be talking about some of them this evening. But for the most part, she's really going to be talking about the role that's played by the Office of Legislative Services in writing and uh, um, uh, doing all the drafting and refining of legislation that is going to be making its way through the state legislature. Uh, Ms. Horowitz has an MBA, or an MPA, I should say, from the School of Public Affairs at Baruch. She is, uh, she also has a BA from uh, Barnard College. And lastly, she is a resident of Highland Park. So she's talking to all of her friends and neighbors. Um, before we uh, start, I did just want to mention that there are two upcoming events. On October 23rd, uh, David Robinson, who is the official state climatologist, and was also uh, a Rutgers uh, University faculty member, will be talking about uh, climate change in New Jersey and what we can expect to see in the next coming decades. And then on November 18th, uh, we're gonna have a session on creating an age-friendly community. What a town like Highland Park can do to help people stay, at, stay in their homes as they age. And we're gonna be having Emily Greenfield, who's from Rutgers School of Social Work, uh, Christine Newman from the AARP, and Kathy Rowe of Soma Two Towns, which is a combination of South Orange and Maplewood, and they have created an age-friendly community, and we're going to be hearing how they did that. So, that's for the future. For this evening, I'd like to give the mic over to Perry, and we'll hear more about it. I'm going to try not to trip over the wire as I talk. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, by a show of hands, how many people in this room have taken a class at some point in their lives in civics or government? Okay. How many of you did that in the state of New Jersey? Okay, so now we're really zeroing in on somebody. But how many of you have heard of the Office of Legislative Services? Only because we've talked about it, but okay. Fair enough. So we're the nonpartisan office of the legislature. We do pretty much any kind of support work that the legislature needs to accomplish its job of making laws in the state of New Jersey. And I will talk about all the functions to some extent. There are various handouts or brochures in the back that describe them in much more detail. Um, it would take me a lot of time to discuss all the functions in great detail. So what I want to focus on is the following tonight. What we're not talking about. We're not talking about politics and we're not talking about policies. Part of being nonpartisan is I don't get to talk about those things. I don't get to engage in those practices. None of my staff do. So that's what we're not going to be talking about. But what we, what we are going to be talking about is what some people might consider basic civics. We'll talk about the legislature and the legislative process. We'll talk about OLS and what we do to serve the legislators and help them do their jobs, as well as what we do in direct public services, if you will. Obviously, by helping legislators, we are helping the public and serving the public, but it's in a more direct way. And there's plenty of time for questions and answers at the end, but it was very clear that I needed to allow for that. And one of the challenges I had when I was putting together this presentation 
was trying to find the right equilibrium between making it interesting to people who know about OLS and know what we do and are very familiar with state governments, but also making it interesting and useful for people who don't know about governments and are coming to this event and coming to this series because they want to learn more about governments. So the question and the answer is period is a good time to recapture that equilibrium by losing it at any point in the process. So on the most basic level, but am, I block, am I blocking this? Okay, that's something we didn't think about. Okay, so I'm just going to move myself over and I'm gonna lunge for the clicker or the advance button. So we operate under a system of many laws at different levels of government, federal, state, county, and local. Um, at each level of government, there are different, different um, agencies, different requirements, different separations of powers. That's kind of a core principle. Again, this is not the in-depth physics, so I can't talk about that in too much detail, but recognize that that exists on every level of government. In general, there are three branches. Legislative, to make laws. Executive, to carry out the laws through policies that are based on those laws. And the judicial branch, to mediate disputes and decide the constitutionality of laws. This is a system of checks and balances. We hear about that all the time. And we see it on all levels of government, including New Jersey state government. The legislature, New Jersey is divided into 40 legislative districts. Each district elects a senator, one senator, and two members of the General Assembly. There are minimum requirements to be elected to those bodies and to take your seats. The Senate generally serves four-year terms. The Assembly generally, generally, the General Assembly generally serves two-year terms. Um, the Senate President leads the Senate, the Speaker leads, leads the General Assembly, and they are elected by their members. The legislature exists, is constituted for a two-year term. We're at the very end, or approaching the end of the second year of the 218th legislature. Elections are held in November. In this particular year, the Assembly is up for election. That's why you might see some campaign signs around town or elsewhere when you drive around the state. I was in Princeton this morning, and it's a contested district, and there were campaign signs all over the place. Um, a random trivia question is, the term begins at noon, not at one, not at two, but at noon, on the second Tuesday of January of each even number of year. Legislative sessions in New Jersey are kind of up to the discretion of the leadership. There's no rule that says how many days or how much timing or how long or how frequently or anything like that. Um, it makes New Jersey a little bit different than other state legislatures. Some meet a lot more frequently, most meet a lot less frequently. Traditionally, it's Mondays and Thursdays, so if you come visit me in Trenton, and you're more than welcome to, I'll take you on the tour, um, you will find that the vibe in the building is very different on most Mondays and Thursdays than it is on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Friday. Uh, but that could change. It could change at any time, and leadership gets to set that schedule. Leadership sets not only the schedule, but also the agenda. They decide what moves. They appoint people to run the business <laughs> operations of the houses, and they appoint chairs and members of standing reference committees. They can also change the committee structures. They can create new committees. They can abolish committees, et cetera, et cetera. They have control, essentially, well, they spearhead house rules. So each house has rules that governs itself, and they are um, led the leadership. One of the brochures, in fact, maybe two of the brochures that I've left the, at the back of the room if you're interested, has a very nice flow chart of what I'm about to talk about. And what I'll talk about next is where the bill starts, how it goes through the process, and then I'll talk more about how OLS plays a role in that process. So every bill starts with an idea, and ideas come from lots of different places. We'll talk about some of those places shortly. And from OLS's perspective, a bill starts with an idea that's communicated to us with a request to draft something. And an idea can be extremely detailed and include specific information that a legislator wants included. Or it can be, yeah, we gotta do something about those taxes. I want a bill that does something for the taxes, raises it, lowers it, whatever the case might be. It could be really, really meaty. It could be really, we need more information to work with you. And therefore, some of the requests we get are extremely Self-standing, basically, it comes in, there's no real interaction over it, we produce a draft of the bill, the legislator likes it, and then it moves on to 
be proposed for introduction and introduced in first reading and just start through the process. In other cases, it is a long, drawn-out process. There's a lot of interactions, a lot of discussions, a lot of well, what are you looking for? What is your end goal? What do, you, what do you want this bill to achieve? And that can be very interactive. It could be in person, it could be over the phone, it could be communications, it could be separate research avenues or tangents that get followed. It's very, very dependent on what the legislator asks for. We're not creating these ideas. We're helping put them in form, we're helping develop them, but they're not our ideas, we are not the policy makers. Um, once the bill is introduced, it gets assigned or referred to a committee, and the committee process is really where the most public input takes place. Now, not everything makes it through the committee process. I have some really interesting numbers that I'll share with you later in the presentation, but leadership decides which committee gets the bill. The committees are generally organized by subject area, so there is, for example, a Housing and Community Development Committee in the Assembly. There's a Science and Technology Committee in the Assembly. There's um, a labor committee in both houses, I think. Um, anyway, so there are a bunch of different committees. The committees get, generally get bills assigned to them based on subject area, although sometimes there are political considerations that dictate a particular bill being assigned to a particular committee where the subject matter connection is perhaps a little not as clear or not as obvious. Um, there are a lot of bills introduced. Not everything makes it on to a committee agenda, but once it does, the public has the opportunity to come and speak and provide testimony in person, provide written testimony. Um, the committee process is where many amendments to draft bills are requested and, and worked on. That's where a lot of negotiation takes place. A committee will vote on it, votes are in public, and once the committee votes on it, it gets reported out from committee and moves on to the next part of the process. Some bills go straight to the floor for a potential vote. Again, that's controlled to the legislative agenda and some bills never make it there, but that's the process. And others get referred to a second reference committee, usually ones with a fiscal impact, so budget, one of the budget or appropriations committees. On the floor is where bills are voted on for final passage, that's at the end of the slide. It's a further opportunity to propose, amend, and debate bills, but really the public input is not there. Public input has happened previously at the committee stage or in the interim steps. Um, on this slide, I have a lot of information about procedural motions and how things happen, the order of events, and so forth. Um, it's also accounted for in some of the materials I've left, and I don't want to bore anybody with that, but I, I will emphasize that there's, there are procedural processes. Procedure is extremely important. Um, there's an order of events. There are procedural questions that we provide answers to from a nonpartisan perspective. I mean, the leadership and members have their own people that they sometimes consult, but we, my office includes the Office of Legislative Council, which answers questions about what can and can't be done, whether a bill is ripe for voting, whether it's followed all the requirements of the Constitution and the House rules to get to where it needs to go. Um, as an aside, on the floor, we're also providing support in the forms of assisting with the voting process. So in the Senate, OLS staff actually runs a voting machine. In the Assembly, we provide assistance to the Assembly clerk and actually have two step members who sit up there on the um, podium with the Assembly clerk and assist in the process that way. So we're involved in really just about any aspect of legislative operations in big ways and small ways, obvious ways and not so obvious ways. Once the bill is approved, voted on by both the houses of the legislature, it goes on to the governor, the governor has certain options. Um, the governor can sign the bill, the governor cannot do anything with the bill and it becomes law after a certain amount of time passes. Um, a, Governor can exercise an absolute veto, which means absolutely not, nothing, I'm not taking it. Um, a conditional veto can be exercised, which means essentially the governor gets to amend the bill as it was passed by the legislature, and the legislature can then agree with that or disagree with that. Um, I have that information up here about the requirements of what the legislature, do, what the legislature needs to do to accomplish certain steps. Um, very often, when people who are in the field of government talk about the governorship of different states and do comparisons between legislatures and states and so forth, um, the governor of New Jersey is often considered to be a very powerful governor compared to other states. And that's because 
there are so many options with regard to what kind of vetoes can be exercised and what, it ne what is needed to overrule, override, excuse me, those and so forth. Um, and we, again, assist in some of the activity just in moving the bills back and forth and proofing them and making sure what goes to the governor's office is the right version and what comes back is the right version and so forth and so on. Again, involved in very many steps of the process. Uh, we are not the only staff in the legislature. We are the largest staff in the legislature, um, but we're not the only. So each partisan, each caucus of the legislature, in each house and each party, has their own staff office. They operate under the direction of party leadership. They also provide, they provide some similar services and some completely different services than what we provide. So we provide nonpartisan research of all types for all members. Um, they will provide research services to their members of their own caucus, um, and it, it's not, it's partisan, it's not not partisan. They do a lot of um, what I would call public relations kind of work, so we don't, everything we put out is about the legislature, it's about individual members of the legislature as members of the legislature. They will put out press releases, for example, saying Senator so-and-so sponsored the XYZ bill to accomplish fill in the blank, raising property taxes, lowering property taxes, whatever they're taking credit or avoiding blame for. That's, that comes out of the partisan offices to some extent. It also comes out from legislators' individual staff. We, we commonly refer to them as district office staff because they're based in the home district of the legislators, and each legislator gets an allowance for that kind of staffing. Oftentimes, the request from a legislator is communicated to us at OLS through their district office staff. Um, another difference structurally is OLS is, if you will, a permanent staff. There are a lot of people at OLS who have served long and distinguished careers doing the kind of work they do and developing the kind of expertise that they have. And that kind of long-term subject matter expertise is generally only found in OLS. It's generally not found, again, generalization, but generally not found in the other kinds of staff. And so that has a very intrinsic, valuable level, uh, value. It, it, it has intrinsic value to the legislature as an institution. Because there are folks who worked on the original bill when it was amended five years later, 10 years later, 15 years later, whatever it is. And they know the whole history of things that were tried, things that didn't work, things that were amended, things, the whole journey, if you will, of how we got to where we are today. I would also point out that this is a model that New Jersey has, but not necessarily in all states. Every state legislature has a different model. In some cases, whereas we have a large staff that does a lot of different things, as you see from the list on the screen right now, um, in some states, some state legislatures, these services are separated into multiple different offices. In some states, there are fiscal offices that do the fiscal work. There are legal offices that do the legal work. There's drafting is done separately. Here we have people who are doing this in a much more integrated way, as well as coming under the same umbrella organization as a lot of services that perhaps you don't think of even necessarily as being associated with the legislature. So we've got quite a lot of different things here. Um, and I'll dig, I'll dig deeper into some of them as I go along. Um, some of them are obvious for legislature, general legal and um, fiscal research and analysis, because that's the bread and butter, if you will, of the legislature. Bill drafting um, and all the work that goes into that, having legal opinions to justify or um, understand the constitutionality of what's being done. Um, office, the Office of Legislative Services also includes the Office of the State Auditor. So about 90 or so members of the staff are involved in auditing state programs, state agencies, state authorities, um, typically looking for the classic, what auditors look for, waste, fraud, and abuse, and they issue audit reports under our auspices. Um, we also do a lot of public information kind of work, a lot of information technology work, and as I mentioned earlier, it, it, some of it is in direct support of legislators, some of it is in direct support of the public, and some it's kind of a cross between them. So more background about OLS in particular, we operate under the jurisdiction of the Legislative Services Commission, which is a 16-member body comprised of eight members from each house, and each house's delegation is 
split by party, so it is truly bipartisan. Um, the presiding officers appoint the members and they appoint themselves. Uh, OLS is approximately 350 employees doing all the different kind of work I just described. We're, or we're organized into eight operating units or offices. Um, state auditing is the second largest. The other one is what we call the central management unit, which includes all the people who do the bill drafting um, and the research and analysis. I mentioned before we're nonpartisan. That means I can't talk about politics. That means we don't operate in that vein. We don't do that kind of work. Um, and it's really a condition on employment. I would also mention, and it's bolded on the slide, that our work is confidential, which means this talk might not be as exciting as we hoped it would be when you came. Sorry. Um, but we take that incredibly, incredibly seriously because when we do a job for any particular legislator, we don't share that with another legislator. And sometimes that creates conflict. Sometimes that makes our jobs a little bit difficult. Um, but the work is kept confidential and once they introduce the bill, the bill is public and that's that. But research requests, wouldn't you like to know what somebody else is looking at? Or sometimes we're doing actually answering the same question for two different people, but we would never tell them that we're answering it for somebody else, or a third person or a tenth person or whatever it is. Talk a little bit more about what kinds of research and what we produce shortly. Our staff in what we call the central management unit is organized by subject matter areas. So we it's uh, 10 different sections and Obviously, many policy areas in New, Jer in New Jersey cross those lines, and so we have a collaborative staff, and oftentimes some particular issue is worked on by multiple staff members in multiple disciplines working together to come up with what is responsive to the member's request. Um, people develop really great subject matter expertise in different things. Sometimes there's repetition, as I said, sometimes you might have written a bill on this five years ago, ten years ago. What's old is new again comes up plenty of times. Um, what we produce might be in the form of a bill, draft a bill on X, it might be draft a resolution on X to make a statement about something. It might be a report, it might be a memorandum, it could be a quick email. Sometimes questions or research requests get answered with a quick phone call, hey, we looked up the answers, yes, or no, or whatever the case may be. By law, some bills require fiscal estimates. That means that our legislative budget and finance office is required to attempt to answer the question of, well, how much would this cost if this were implemented? Oftentimes, it's hard to know the answer to that question, but research is done and we publish those things, actually, so that legislators and the public know how we come to that estimate um, if we can't come to the estimate, what prevents us from doing the work, and doesn't prevent us from doing the work, what prevents us from coming up with a concrete number of why something is the way it is. So I wanted to share with you a few numbers to give you a sense of the magnitude and scope of what we're talking about here. So as I mentioned, we're coming towards the end of the 218th legislature, so the end of the two year cycle. And so far, the number of bills and resolutions that have been introduced this session is 10,967. So that means, and there's some duplication there because it might have been introduced in both houses and that would get counted separately. But 10,967 pieces of legislation have been introduced in less than two years. We've also done a lot of other work, a lot of other research kinds of assignments and fiscal analyses and so forth. And the number we, I pulled on that as of yesterday was 18,560 general assignments. And again, those could be complex research assignments that take weeks and weeks and weeks to do and involve lots of back and forth with the person requesting it and requests for information going out to places all around the country or every municipality in the state or whatever the case may be. Or it might be something as, I dare say something that somebody might have been able to Google on their own and come up with a decent enough answer to. Not to diminish the work we do, that is not what I'm trying to say at all. I'm trying to say that the level of complexity is extremely variable, and the length of time it takes to do it is extremely variable, but we take it all quite seriously. Um, we've also produced 1,168 fiscal estimates. That means, and that's not for every bill that requires one, it's just what we've actually 
turned in. Um, and another way to see this in perspective is, I said a couple minutes ago that there were 10,967 bills and resolutions introduced. Of that total, so far to date, 2,437 have been reported from committee. So if you do the math, that's roughly 20%, approximately one-fifth. And of that, 428 laws have been enacted, and 93 resolutions have been filed with the Secretary of State, which is also roughly 20% of the previous number. So you get a sense of how much work is involved and what's being asked for and what's being considered and what doesn't go through. Um, and some things are produced because somebody has an idea and just wants it memorialized in some way. Some people expect everything to pass. Some things, not so much. Um, when we produce legislation, when we do drafts, we have guidelines for pretty much everything we do. Everything's got a particular form. Everything's got a particular way of expressing it. If you notice, oh, sorry, it's not this slide, another slide. It actually sort of showed how um, it's presented. We follow guidelines for all this stuff. Everything gets, goes through multiple layers of review. Um, a draft, something that's requested might never be introduced. Something might go through many, many, many versions before it gets introduced. It might go through many, many, many versions of amendments, either versions of themselves or just amendments before they get to be considered at any stage of the process. Ideas come from all sorts of places. They come from somebody waking up, a legislator coming up, waking up in the morning and having a great idea. You read that and solve this issue, this public policy issue faced in New Jersey. It comes from constituents in the general public. Sometimes we know where it's coming from when the legislator gives us the request, sometimes we don't. Sometimes it comes from lobbyists representing a particular interest group or cause or whatever the case may be. Sometimes it comes from the news. We kind of have a joke that if something's really happening and people are really, really excited on uh, New Jersey 101.5 in the morning, we kind of know what we're going to be doing that day because it means it's going to be a research request or a bail draft request or whatever it is. So when things get really heated there, it's a good, it's a, it's a good barometer. We also get ideas from legislators who hear about something some other state is doing. They do talk to legislators from other states. Sometimes they have a brilliant idea because, hey, it worked really well in Michigan or Texas or whatever it is. And so we end up doing a lot of work where we reach out to colleagues and legislatures in other states. We use resources provided by the Council of State Governments and the National um, Conference of State Legislatures to learn about what other states are doing and try to produce stuff that meets the needs of the legislature. Um, they also hear about research and studies, various think tanks put out reports, they get into the hands of legislators, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, here's a new idea. This is today's bill request, or this is the research request. Hey, would this work in New Jersey? Hey, has any municipality ever tried this? Maybe it's something we should expand, expand to be a statewide program or whatever the case may be. So ideas come from all these places. There are different reasons why people introduce bills. Obviously, great ideas are great ideas. But sometimes it's to get to satisfy a constituent. A constituent is really upset about something and saying that they will solve the problem by trying to get the law changed as a way of addressing the situation. Some legislators care about quantity. They want to introduce a lot of bills, they want to sponsor a lot of bills or co-sponsor a lot of bills, they want their names on things. Others are really focused on specific issues and really don't ask necessarily for a lot of bills to be drafted, but really spend a lot of time on the ones they draft. It's very, very variable. Um, and we sometimes we know about this motivation, sometimes we don't. It's sometimes that information is shared with us, sometimes not. Sometimes it helps us when we're doing the work to know what the purpose is or whether the legislator thinks it's something that's going to move through the process or whether it's being introduced more for to meet a, a specific need. This slide briefly is almost like a checklist of what our drafters do when they're thinking about a bill. So what's the bill doing? What's its purpose? What's it trying to accomplish? Does it have penalties if you violate the new law? Uh, does it involve money? Is money needed to fund whatever this new law is creating? Does it have to repeal an existing law? Is it retroactive? Is it prospective? Does it go into effect on a date certain or 30 days from when it's enacted? All these kinds of questions are what we deal with when we're drafting bills. And if you notice the bottom of the slide, amendments delete is in brackets and add is an underline. That's a deliberate showing of how those bills actually look. 
So when somebody's amending a section of law by adding something, the new text shows up underlined, etc. OLS staff also works in support of the committees. So we have specific staff who are assigned as, as committee aides and committee secretaries. They support the chairs in making sure the meetings run smoothly. They, they put out the meeting notice agendas um, so that the public can know what is happening and when. Um, they prepare amendments. They answer questions about bills that are before committees. They do all that work for members upon request. They take care of records of committee activity. They um, literally collect the vote totals and they're responsible post-committee meeting for committee statements describing what happened in the bill. I briefly wanted to talk about the budget process because it's something else that we support very heavily. Um, it starts with, with the governor delivering budget address to joint session of the legislature in February of each year. Uh, the budget and appropriations committees conduct research and hold hearings. Some of the hearings are open public hearings, and some of them are executive branch agency hearings, and we support all that activity. For the executive branch agencies, essentially we're drafting questions and seeking information for the legislators, and that information is often forms the basis of the questions that the legislators ask the executive agency representatives at those meetings. Uh, both houses must pass an Appropriations Act. Um, fiscal year ends on June 30th. The past couple of years, there have been shutdown talks um, when didn't wasn't clear what was happening with the budget, and the budget is, in some respects, another bill that OLS drafts. It's kind of a monster bill because it's very, very long and has a lot of tables and numbers and moving parts to it, but in many respects, it is just another ginormous bill on our plate for um, the legislature. So <coughs> it's a big part of our regular cycle of work. So we, as I mentioned, we do a lot of other things for legislators, and we're bound by confidentiality in all of these areas. We issue legal opinions, bless you, um, upon request to members. Those are confidential. Oftentimes, the member eschews confidentiality because releasing it serves a purpose in either moving a bill forward or defending something that, a defending a bill that had already moved forward or whatever the case may be. It's often questions about the constitutionality of something or whether what the process needs to be with regard to particular legislative activity or whatever the case may be. We provide parliamentary procedural advice. We locate, um, lease, and help maintain district offices. So by, by rule, every legislator is entitled to have an office in their home district. And we're responsible for finding, helping them find a space that meets the rules, actually paying the rents, ensuring that the utilities are on, not turned off for lack of payment. We pay all those bills, um, again, subject to the rules, and make sure that things run smoothly there in the sense of keeping them compliant with the district office rules. We also do a lot of work in the legislative information technology area. In district offices, we provide them with computers and telephones and technology equipment there and deal with and if something goes wrong, we get the service call and we have a service desk for that. We also deal with all the information technology infrastructure at the State House. Everything from the computer on my desk and the fact that I have this presentation on a nice little thumb drive, um, little things like that, all the way to the voting systems in the chambers. We actually did a big replacement project a couple months ago replacing the boards that were really on their, where they passed their last legs. So everything technological, and today I dealt with the question about Wi-Fi in the State House. So all that stuff. We run the legislative library and provide reference services. So those reference services might be directly to a legislator or it might be for our staff or district office staff member who's doing research for a legislator. We draft ceremonial resolutions. So when the Highland Park Middle School debate team, let's say, or cheerleading squad wins the state championship, and one of the members of the legislature wants to congratulate them and commend them and say they've done a bang up job and it's amazing, they can request from OLS assistance in preparing that ceremonial resolution and giving that eventually to the Highland Park Middle School or wherever the case may be. So it's a really big part of constituent services, the ability to 
help members do that stuff. So again, we're doing it in service to the legislator, they're the ones requesting it, but ultimately it benefits the member of the public who is the recipient. And we hear all these great stories actually from people who have them hanging on their walls or had there was a story in one of the books, somebody sent me an obituary where somebody talked about how a woman was buried with her ceremonial resolution. So it's just, it's nice when you hear those kinds of stories. We also produce all sorts of publications and legislative information. I brought some samples of pamphlets and brochures that are available in the back. If you look on the legislative website, um, which I'll talk about next, most of our publications are available there, and as well as lots of other information. Um, the handout, this handout has essentially the same information that I have on my slide, lots of information about what we put up there. It is of great public interest. If you're interested in following a bill, if you just want to know who your member is, you can look him or her up and find out about him or her. Um, we have pictures, bios, things like that, that's based on what they submit. We don't write those ourselves. Um, I say that specifically because I've got questions about why some of the pictures, the photographs of the legislators seem a little dated. We put up the picture. And I say that in a very nice way. Um, you can pretty much research anything about what the legislature is doing or considering by looking at the website. Um, and we provide help if you call to navigate it and find it and so forth. Um, one of my big projects at the moment is working on upgrading the look of the website because it's got a ton of information and it could use We've been working on some branding campaigns to make it cleaner and crisper, and that's part of what we've been thinking about lately. Um, you can also file a request for public information, open, open Public Records Act. That's a very popular thing for citizens to know and be aware of. Um, I would also call your attention to the information about civics and the State House and education and all that kind of stuff, because to me, Speaking here tonight is essentially an extension of that kind of work, so I mentioned that. But the end war is really important there. With regard to services directly to the public, um, we answer the phone, we talk to people, we tell them they didn't really mean to call us, they meant to call the executive agency or whatever the case may be. We're very good at directing traffic, we help people navigate the website, we provide all sorts of information. Um, about bills, about process, um, or what happened to this, what happened to that. Sometimes we get angry phone calls that are really not intended to be directed at the nonpartisan people who are just helping things along, but we deal with those respectfully and very well as well. OLS also coordinates the public use program at the State House Complex. So that means private groups and organizations can make use of certain space in the State House um, upon request. And so we coordinate that for the, for the State House. And we provide, we run the State House tour program. Again, that's something that's different. In some states it's run by the State Museum or the State Library or volunteers or whatever the case may be. We have a very robust program that in fact, I, think, I don't have the final numbers from the school year that just ended, but something like 15,000 school kids come through every year um, on school trips. So we do that, we do civics education, we have a make a law program where kids can act as a legislator um, and discuss the merits of a bill and talk about whether they would vote yes or no and so forth. And it's, a, I think, a really great um, experience for kids. One of the brochures that I left is about visiting the New Jersey State House Complex. Um, I want to close, or at least wind down tonight, by talking about opportunities for public participation in the legislative process. Um, you can track legislative activity, you can care about ideas, you can attend committee meetings and speak and attend, attend, give testimony, oral or, or written. You can contact your legislators about all sorts of things. I can assure you that your ideas do make it into legislation and into policy discussions because plenty of the requests we deal with are legislator X saying, I have a constituent with a problem, I have a constituent with a concern, how do I make this better, what, what law is impacted by this? Sometimes we just do research assignments because a, a member of the public has called his or her legislator and said, some state governmental agency is haranguing them over something or they're in conflict with the state agency in some way. And what happens, and, and 
the legislator wants to know, well, what are they supposed to be doing? What does the law actually say about what's supposed to happen when, how, etc.? And sometimes we provide them with the research so that they can better handle the constituent concern or request. So you can also contact regarding your own ideas, advocate for things that are before the legislature. And also, I would encourage you, if you're happy with something your legislator did, then thank them. Um, and if you're unhappy, respectfully express that as well. That's all part of the civic process. Um, finally, you can participate by coming to Trenton, coming to the legislature, observing a session, coming to a committee meeting, et cetera, because showing up is part of participation. Um, that is the end of my prepared talk. Um, I want to close by saying that it's very clear to me and to a lot of practitioners that we live in a time where people are very unhappy with government, that people are very dissatisfied with government, both for partisan reasons and nonpartisan reasons. And satisfaction with government is really, doesn't do too well in public opinion surveys these days, let's put it that way. And I'd like to think that by taking the opportunity to speak here, by talking about what my agency does, by talking about what the legislature does, that it contributes in a positive way to that discussion and that hopefully if there were concerns that I've somehow advanced the discussion in a good way with that. So I'm very happy to discuss, take questions, and thank you for being here tonight. I get the right to uh, uh, make the first comment, which is I'm exhausted just thinking about what all you guys do. I mean, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, the, the scope of, of what you do. And I wonder, how long has the OLS been in existence? And do you know why they put so many different functions in that, that one agency? Um, so OLS in its current organizational form has been in existence since the mid-1980s. There was a reorganization that took place at that time. Prior to that, we resembled other states in that there was a separate office of counsel and a separate office of fiscal affairs and a separate office of public information, several different groups. And I don't know what the exact impetus at that moment in history was, but I think it had to do with providing better services and more cohesive services because you might have someone do research and then you have to go to a separate person in a separate agency with a separate boss and get them to draft the bill. And I think that people realized it wasn't the most efficient way of doing it. So I think that's where it started from. Um, different things were joined and tacked on at different stages and obviously an organization evolves. In, in the mid-80s when this happened, I don't think there was a technology unit. I don't think there was a need for technology. I have I have heard stories of how uh, now we use bill drafting tools. We use Word. We have all these macros and templates that we use in Word to draft a bill, for example. I have heard many stories of people who have who had copied things by hand from books, who had literally cut with a scissor and pasted with scotch tape bills together to cobble pieces together and show changes back in the 70s and 80s. Um, so the technology thing has grown tremendously and that's a whole part of the staff that supports all of it. Um, um, I have a couple of questions but I want to open it to the audience and I have to meet you. Can, sure. can you repeat the question also? Thanks, that's very helpful. So the question was about what is the pocket veto and how is it used and why does it exist, I guess is a consolidated question a little bit, that's basically what it is. So the end of the legislative session is a little bit chaotic, that might be the understatement of the night, um, because members are linked up, and so their considerations and taking action on things is a different consideration than it might be at some other point in the legislative cycle. Because the legislature operates on the two-year cycle, 
when that Tuesday, that second Tuesday in January comes, the old legislature doesn't exist anymore. It, 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 it can't do anything. So this pocket veto exists because of the confluence of timing and gives, but the governor's term might be continuing. In fact, always is continuing at that point. So it's a weird confluence of legislature doesn't exist really to do what it might have done otherwise. I didn't answer that well. No. Uh, so there are different rules for the Yes, there are different rules about what what happens when the legislature passes something and what could happen to it. The timing is different. Um, what what tools are at the governor's disposal are a little bit different because of the timing. It's really all driven by timing. As an extension, that information is in the website that we can actually see what those different rules are. I'm just curious. Yes, it's in the it's in one of our That's okay. It's in one of the publications I brought with me, I believe. Okay. So that could be online. Yeah, oh definitely. Definitely. Yes, thank you. Yes, it's hard, but so great to talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Real. Uh, so, do you see any, uh, if you see the, uh, the legislative process, um, how much, do you see any replication in other state legislatures? And if there is, um, have you noticed any replication, any pattern along the lines of, let's say, more commonality? So, if I heard the question correctly, I, you're asking about replication in other state legislatures and, and similarities and differences? Well, yeah, but I guess when it comes to uh, regarding the uh, legislative process, let's say it was, it was in New York or Connecticut, uh, for instance, do, uh, do their legislatures work, uh, do they receive any procedures the same uh, way So, do the other states engage in a similar process? Okay, so I would say that most legislatures certainly do variations on a theme um, in terms of the bill gets proposed, the bill gets introduced. Some, many of them have first, second, third readings, not all of them. Many, many states, most states I would say, have committees. Um, the number and size of the standing reference committees will vary. How long things go be, take before a committee will vary. Um, New Jersey is similar to some of the northeast states, or more similar to north, some of the northeast states than some of the western states in terms of um, timing and session length and all that. Um, in legislatures where they only meet, let's say, two months in every two years, or two months a year, or six weeks in a year, or, or, and there are such legislatures, the, the volume is very different, the timing is very different, because they're just doing things in a much different pattern of doing business. So that makes a big difference. Certainly New York and Connecticut both have committee structures. Um, that, I, that I know most states do. There are people who spend all their time, their professional careers studying state legislatures and can tell you the differences and the similarities in all of them. I know a bunch of them, a bunch of the similarities and differences, I don't know them all. I'm also, from where I sit, what I've also been very interested in the past few years is not so much the process of how a bill becomes a law in different legislatures, but I'm very interested in staffing issues in legislatures and what states have models that are similar to OLSs and how, what have central staffs, why they have nonpartisan staffs versus partisan staffs, the breakdown between those different things. That's where my personal interest lies because I'm trying to run the, the nonpartisan staff office, so I'm interested in other models of that. Gotcha. Thank you. That's a uh, point helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I have a, a, a quick question. Um, you've talked about you keep things completely confidential so that you could be working on, you know, some kind of uh, legislation or draft on an issue for one person at the same time you're working for another. Are you, have you ever been in a situation where you were um, preparing uh, a piece of legislation that was primarily the, a Republic, for a Republican leg, uh, legislator and on the same topic, uh, you were 
completing a, uh, uh, a draft for a Democratic legislator. Does that happen? That happens all the time. Yeah, that happens. That happens all the time. I mean, my classic example is somebody could be writing a bill that does one thing in the morning and writing the same bill that does the complete opposite thing in the afternoon. And it's not it's maybe intellectually challenging, which is a good thing because we like to be intellectually challenged, but it's pretty routine. Um, you know, sometimes we're keeping secrets between members of the same party. It, 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 it really doesn't matter. It's legislator by legislator. So yes, party is important in that, it's particularly important in that, but we'd be in violation of our statute just as much if we told legislator A of party one something that legislator B of party one was also doing. For, for our purposes, the, the, the obligation is the same. Uh, is it part of your mandate to provide research to the general public who calls your office and wants to know about something or other? So we don't provide research services to the general public with regard to policy. We do provide research assistance for public information kinds of things. So if you're a member of the public and you want certain bills or bills on a certain topic, we will help you find those bills. Yeah. But we won't research for you what why other state it? legislatures have done with regard to that policy area, for example, or why it is the way it is. So we'll provide a lot of research assistance for public information, but we don't answer policy research questions. So it's kind of different staff, essentially it's different staff. The Office of Public Information deals with all sorts of questions all the time in all forms and formats um, to provide public information to people. But our, the people who are doing research on that might or could lead to bill drafting do not do policy research for the public. Yes? Um, on bills where there's either an interplay with federal law or possible would, would you simply research that, or is there some kind of um, communication that goes on with the federal office um, regarding that? So that depends on exactly what we're being asked to do. There is no question that many of the questions that are posed to OLS by legislators have federal law implications. And sometimes the research question we're asked to answer is a question that involves researching federal law on something, or federal policy, or federal something, and we answer those questions. Sometimes we get legal questions about whether federal law preempts the state from doing something. So legislator X proposes, wants to propose a bill that does something, and whoever's charged with drafting it says, hmm, this might pose a problem, this might be preempted. And so there's some sort of back and forth with the legislator. Ultimately, the legislator can choose to introduce it. We can't stop her or him from doing that. But we can say, we've noticed this issue. We can suggest they seek a legal opinion from us about it or, or do some other research or whatever it is about the question. So they can actually just introduce a, a, a law that's blatantly unconstitutional and then That's correct. Or it might be they they're introducing it, but they don't ever expect it to get to committee. That could they, it could be essentially a statement on something. Again, not and when I say that, there's no malice associated with what I'm trying to say. There are different reasons why people do things, and so it may have been to make a statement about something. Um, and you know, ultimately, to go back to the beginning of the talk, there are three branches of government, and ultimately. If something might be unconstitutional, the way to figure that out is by filing a lawsuit or challenging it in court. And so ultimately, the judiciary decides whether something's constitutional or not. And one of the questions that things gets read through as well is it's going to pass constitutional muster. And you never know what a court is going to decide. You never know what legal arguments are going to be posed there. But the best thing we can do is research the question, provide the best advice, and some of those confidential legal opinions that we issue to individual members are they're concerned about something they think they're, uh, they're thinking of doing, or sometimes they are concerned about something that somebody in a member 
usually a member of another party might be considering and they want to know what what council's take is on whether it would pass constitutional muster, um, preemption muster, whatever the case may be. Yes, they can waive privilege. They can, they can. I mean, sometimes I've seen this happen. We have issued a confidential legal opinion, and somebody has used it in a press release to say, "Look, I'm right. This is what counsel says. This is this is this is constitutional. I propose this. And it's gonna it's gonna be okay." So it's really up to them. Sometimes um, they choose to share it. Sometimes they don't. Um, but building on the, that comment. How do you handle a situation where, let's say, um, you wrote a legal opinion of whether or not this was constitutional, it's private, but the member chooses to make it public and says, you know, this particular effort being done by a member of the other party is unconstitutional, it'll go nowhere, and all of a sudden you're kind of dragged into a partisan <laughs> fight. Um, how do you handle that? Very carefully. <laughs> Sorry, um, that was being flippant. Uh, it's, we try to avoid the spotlight. I mean, that's our, when I asked at the beginning, well, how many of you have heard of OLS? It's a legitimate question, because if we do our work really, really well, then most people shouldn't know about us. I mean, I think it's important for the civic conversation that we exist. I think it's important that people are aware of it, just in a general civics kind of way. But day to day, it doesn't matter who at OLS drafts a particular bill or wrote a legal opinion, and our, my goal is, not to get something on my Google alert that says OLS in the headlines. And if there's a story that comes up on my Google alert every night on OLS, I'm really hopeful that they're quoting something correctly from a fiscal estimate that we published on the website, as opposed to, I'm not holding a press conference. OLS is never holding a press conference about any of that stuff. So we are very careful with what we say and how we say it. And our, our stock in trade, really, our value to the legislature is that we're the trusted, nonpartisan aides and service providers, if you will, that can do our jobs really, really well and stay under the radar and are really okay with that role. Um, one of the differences for some people between working on the OLS staff and working, let's say, as a research analyst on one of the caucus part partisan staffs is just that. It's whether you want to be in the middle of the political fight or not. And I have absolutely, I, I have lost staff who have chosen, good staff who have chosen to work for members or the parties, the, the caucus staffs, the, the, the majority minority staffs, and they're happy, and I'm happy for them because they like it. They want to have, they want to take political positions. That's okay. I'm really happy where I am not doing that. I, I like that role in my career. Even before OLS, I worked for a different nonpartisan agency, so I like being in that sphere. I like being that person, if you will, or in that role. I find I find you're better, personally, you're better able to appreciate the analytical things. It's that you realize that situations and issues are perhaps more complex than you do if you're really focused on it from a partisan perspective. That doesn't mean I don't respect people who find their passion and their niche and really want to be partisan and find that that's how they best express themselves and feel like they can make a difference. I totally, I mean, the system works because all of this exists. Back and forth? <laughs> yeah, here's a, I'm asking you to, to give up a trade secret here. Okay? So, say legislator one has, has um, finally rolled out a, a bill that's been introduced, right? So, it's public knowledge, and, you know, another legislator says, oh, can he ask for a legal opinion on that bill, and then he structures his questions in a similar way, would you actually just hand over the same opinion? It's certainly possible. I mean, they wouldn't necessarily know that we were but doing they, that, but yeah. To, I mean, when, when, when you're giving it, you have to know the questions that were asked. Correct. And, and, yeah, and, 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 and just like with everything else in life, if you ask a different question, you might get a different answer. And so it totally depends on what question you ask and how you ask the question. But I think that anybody who is in a position to provide advice, certainly legal advice, really values consistency. And I would say that OLS 
values consistency. So if we're asked the same question, I really and truly hope and believe that we're giving the same advice. If we get asked a slightly different question, intentionally or unintentionally, then I think there's a good chance there might be a slightly different answer. So I don't think that's giving up a trade secret, because I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but I appreciate I, the question. I, I, it's, a nuanced, it's a nuanced question, and it has, goes to operations and, and, and thought process and so forth. But I mean, you become a trusted advisor by giving good advice, by giving good advice, by giving sound advice, by giving consistent advice. And I think that's, again, one of our socks in trade. How many staff produce these responses? And do you cross-reference, or do you guys talk as a group? I mean, how do, you, how do you know that there's already been that question answered? In what way? Okay, so, so there's consistency. So a number of different ways. The first is that we track what is requested of us. So we, we, keep, we have lots of databases for all kinds of things. So we track requests. That's how we know whether we've actually done something. Sort of what date did it come in? To whom did it come in? Who's responsible for fulfilling the request? What's the deadline for the request? Does somebody need it tomorrow? Does somebody need it in two weeks? Does somebody say do it when you have a chance? So basic tracking kinds of tools. Um, it's one of the areas where our expertise in subject matters is so, so critical because you talk to someone who's been involved in a particular area, they know what's come up and they know who to talk to within our office. And, and so some people are really known for being, oh, this is the housing expert. You know, if you've got this really strange housing question, go talk to that person because there's a really good chance that they've seen this before or know who else to talk to or know where to look for the answer or know what executive branch under which governor tried to do something that the legislature got really mad at and did something in response to, or whatever the case may be. So a lot of it is just the institutional knowledge, and that's really, again, why we play the role we play and why we're valuable to the legislature. And the partisan stamp role has grown over time. In 1980-something, when the reorganization took place, 84, 85, um, when that took place, the partisan staffs were not nearly as large as they are now. And I know that I have staff members who worry about the size of those staffs growing and what it means for OLS and you know how do you maintain OLS's reputation and all that kind of stuff. But the answer is we're doing something different and we're doing it differently. And that adds value to the process. Yes? Uh, who funds the partisan staffs? Is that funded by the state or? or yes. Can you can't repeat the question? I, I didn't get the oh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was who funds the partisan staffs? And, and the answer is that the, part of the central partisan staffs and the, the majority minority offices are state employees. Um, and the district office staffs are hired by the individual legislators, but they each get a set allowance for the purpose of hiring staff. So how they allocate that is, frankly, I'm glad it's not part of my portfolio, but they have some discretion in you know, do they hire two people and split the money that's allotted to them, or is it four people at lesser paying jobs, and how are the responsibilities divvied up? Um, that's completely not in my portfolio. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, but that, he, was, he was there, so, sorry. He was, he's been, he was placed. Thanks for the time. Uh, so, um, given uh, Trenton's proximate, well, the, the fact that Trenton being, given the fact that Trenton is next door to Pennsylvania, and it's given its relative proximity to other states, let's say just you know, slightly more than an hour from New York, and uh, I want to say maybe 45 minutes to an hour from Delaware and Northeastern Maryland, uh, does the, um, the uh, state house get many visitors as tourists from, uh, from out of state? So the question was, given Trenton's location and its proximity to several large metropolitan areas, does it get a lot of out-of-state visitors? And the answer is happily yes. Um, one of my favorite things is when I happen to bump into one of the tours and find somebody from an interesting place. Um, it's just, it's great because there's always some story involved and so forth. So just yesterday I went upstairs to look at some work that was being done in the Senate caucus room. And it's right outside the Senate gallery. And lo and behold, one of the members of our tour program staff was leading someone from Chicago. And not only was she from Chicago, but she was a capital collector. 
Capital collectors are people who make it their life's mission, or at least a hobby, to go from state to state and visit the state capitals and say they've been to all of them. So she, I got this big introduction. I afraid I don't remember her name, but she was from Chicago. She was a capital collector. And we get people from all around the world, really, um, for all sorts of reasons. Some of them because they're coming to the state capital, some of them because they're interested in history and terms it has other revolutionary war historical um, attractions. Um, like I said, we get lots of school groups. I don't think that's what you meant exactly, but we do get school groups. Um, about maybe two or three weeks ago, we had a couple come in, and we were their 50th state capital. And they were so excited. They were absolutely adorable. They actually came with party hats and noisemakers, and these little, I guess they're birthday cake handles with a five and a zero. We didn't let them light them up, they didn't want to, but we took a photograph of them in a really nice, with a really nice state house backdrop with their party hats and their, their 50, and they were so happy. It was great, they were from Minnesota. I don't know why Trenton was number 50. Um, I find that when you talk to the capital collectors, there is absolutely no rhyme or reason to the order in which they do them, or at least none that's apparent to us. Why? I mean, Trenton is not that far from Harrisburg. It's not that far from other northeast states, but somehow it's not necessarily on the same circuit. So we get lots of visitors. We get visitors from foreign countries as tourists, but we also get visitors from foreign countries who are visiting New Jersey on economic development, business, that kind of stuff. Um, when I started with this presentation together, actually, I started with a presentation that I had given to a delegation of South Korean legislators who visited a couple of years ago. They were from some province in South Korea, they were on a trade mission, I think, and visiting several Northeast states, and they were interested in learning about the legislature and legislative processes. So we get lots of visitors. Come visit. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. I believe you said there was no set link or number of sessions in the legislature, that it always starts on the second Tuesday of January, but other than that, does it have a fixed end date or who can change the end date? The question was about the legislative, the start of the legislative session and the end of the legislative session and kind of what happens in between and the scheduling, essentially. So the start date was the second Tuesday, of January at noon. The end date essentially is 11.59 a.m. of that same day, um, or sooner. What? Um, so there's no break there's, between legislative sessions? Technically, there doesn't have to be. I mean, they don't have to be in session at 11.59 when it technically ends. They can adjourn before that. But technically, they can be, the old legislature can do business up to that point and the new legislature takes office and starts thereafter. So with the chaotic 10 days, are the 10 days right before the new one starts? It is a very chaotic period because that's when they want to do last minute business. Um, it's called lame duck because, again, there are fewer consequences, if you will, of doing something, political consequences, I mean, potentially, and so that's a consideration. It is very busy. There are things that are introduced at the last minute and rush through the process. There are times when you get I would say periods like that and other busy and high stress periods are when things are done with emergency votes where you need to get a bigger majority to actually move something faster. Things get sometimes rushed through committee or moved to second reading without committee sometimes. Again, I'm not suggesting this is normal. I'm saying you're more likely to see those things at periods of high stress. Another period of high stress is right before the budget deadline when not only the budget gets passed, but it's often times when the legislature is very busy with other issues and moving a lot of things at that time as well. Um, so. But in between, between the beginning and the end of the two-year cycle, it's really up to leadership how often the legislature is in, how often they meet, how often they have voting sessions, how often they have committee meetings. And it really is tied to what they want to do. It's, it, it's agenda set priority setting. And from where we sit as a staff, it's an ebb and a flow. It's a very cyclical sort of process. 
it changes, but it doesn't change. I mean, we generally know that summer is quieter, by and large. Um, but summers in 2019 or the 20-teens have been busier, from what I understand, than summers were in the early 2000s or the 1990s or whatever it is, because then the legislature really took a summer vacation, and they don't quite, take quite as full of vacation as they used to do. And for some of my staff members, they we used to have a summer vacation. And we feel like there's just more volume. I mean, one of the numbers, I, I, I read off some numbers of the current legislature, but I also brought some numbers from the previous two-year legislative cycle. And we are really ahead of the pace. So I, the number for this cycle is 10,967 bills and resolutions. For the entire two-year period of the 217th legislature, the total was 9,966. So it's only September, mid-September, and we're already 1,000 ahead. And I didn't bring the number of assignments, but the number of assignments is huge. It's, it's, just, it's gone up. And if the more the legislature's in, the more demands they make on the staff, and the more we work we produce. Yes? So, um, now that you're talking about, so does the, do the requests always need to go through your office, or can they stay in the partisan realm? Can somebody from Democrat, uh, let's say Democrat has something coming up, and they have a question about it, can they go then to the Democratic branch and sure. say, can you do this for us instead of your branch? The question was whether a legislator has to go through OLS to get something done. And the answer is, it depends. Certainly a research request, they can ask wherever they want. They can ask their district office staff member to do the research. They can ask their brother-in-law. I mean, we will, nobody would ever know. Um, but when it comes to drafting a bill, even if they provide every single word of it, we would still be responsible for getting into the correct form and preparing it for introduction. So we might there, might there might be some, I don't think there's terribly many, but there might be some instances where we basically get, here's the bill we want this prepared for introduction, where we're not doing or spending a lot of brain power on the content. And it's more about the form and the process. Um, but we we also provide the support staff that moves those things and make sure the copies go to the right places and the things get stamped the way they're supposed to be stamped and they're officially logged and all that kind of stuff. So because we play that additional role in the process, and tentacles are everywhere in the process, we absolutely have a role to play there too. Yes? So some of the Western states, Utah, Utah that I believe has 40 days of sessions. It just is so mind boggling to me that we have so many more days. They have so few days. It seems to get the business done. I mean, I know it's not as populated as it's that's a huge difference. What can you say? <laughs> so, so the question is what do you say about this, but the, the, the observation was that Western states, particularly Utah, have a very short session. They have a 40-day session, and somehow they managed to get their business done. So why is New Jersey, why is the New Jersey legislature working so hard and doing so much? And several, I can offer several different observations to that. One is that the expectations in some states regarding the role of state government is different. Um, and that happens to be true in some of the Western states where historically government was slower to develop. Uh, they were formed, the states themselves were formed later and government was slower to develop and they were more geographically diverse and so getting people to a central location was just really demanding in the days before planes and cars and all of that. And so, it was a real burden for citizen legislators to come to a central place and make decisions and come together and, and decide business. And so they came up with session schedules or, or, or parameters that were less taxing because 
especially in the origins, everybody was a citizen of the legislature. They were a rancher, they were a doctor, they were a lawyer, they, were, they had other farmer, they had other business that kept them occupied all the time. And so they built a system that required that. Um, I have my counterpart in the Mexico legislature and had this great observation. He told me, and New Mexico, I think, comes in the first year of their session, I think it's 60 days, and the second year it's 30 days or something like that. One year it's more days than the other, but it's also a very small number of days. And he, and he, I think he's worked with the legislature about 20 years or something like that. And he said, the thing that has affected the legislature the most, and has affected the work of his staff the most, is the cell phone. And the reason for that is because in those in the earlier days, a legislator would drive from the far corners of New Mexico to the state capital in Santa Fe, and in Santa Fe somebody would talk their ears off and give them all these ideas, and then they'd have to get back in their truck or their wagon or whatever it was and drive all the way back to the far corners of the state. And they'd have to think about them. They'd have to think about all this information overload and all this stuff that people were asking them for and wanting all these ideas and they'd have to think about it. By the time they got to home, they'd forgotten about it, or they realized it wasn't such a great idea, or it was, it was an idea that didn't need to be developed because it had a beginning, middle, and end already. It was something that didn't need legislation to address it, or whatever the case may be. And he said, and since they got cell phones, every idea gets called in and becomes a bill request, or a research request, or whatever it is, because it's so easy that, that time to ruminate over an idea is lost. So I love telling that story because I think it's just, it's an interesting societal commentary more than anything else um, about how we use technology and how sometimes the thinking time is lost because of it. But I think it somehow explains how legislative business gets transacted also. I think they build what their ideas are around what schedule permits them. And there are organizations that do studies of which states have more regulation and less regulation and all that kind of stuff, and New Jersey tends to be higher on those lists, and perhaps that is a function of having a more active state legislature. Yes? You mentioned earlier that um, it's confidential when the legislator asks you to do something. Do you keep numbers, however, that are available to the public? And you said that some ask a lot and others are more focused and But, um, I, I do want to. No, no, I, that, I did not. No, 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 I didn't say that. No. <laughs> That's my interpretation. Okay. There we go. <laughs> so, um, is there are these numbers the, the number of requests that each one makes to you? Is that available to the public? Do you keep track of that? So, so I'll repeat the question. The question is, do we keep track of who asked for what, and do we make that public? Not the, sorry, not who asked for what, but how many requests people made, okay. and do we make that public? And the answer is, we keep track of pretty much everything we do, because we have to. Um, we don't publish a list of how many requests came from who or what or whatever. That's, that's not published. So it's, not, it's not available to You can try filing an open public records act request. I would have to, it would have to be reviewed by counsel. I'm not, I don't know what the answer to that. It's not something we publish, certainly. One way, though, to tell is you can certainly look up on the website how many bills somebody has sponsored, how many bills somebody has co-sponsored, Etc. And that is not a perfect condition of anything, but it certainly tells you what kind of things go to us because anything that somebody sponsored, presumably, I don't. Well, in most cases, when somebody is the first sponsor of something, the prime sponsor, they're probably the person who requested that it be drafted. Not always, but likely. So the question was, what, under what circumstances would we have to correct something where we've been misquoted or our information is used incorrectly? Um, that is, I think my answer to that is be very careful about that. Um, we get misquoted often, not necessarily by, by legislators, but certainly by 
news accounts that say, oh, Les said this, or it's used a certain way, and it's not necessarily the way we intended it, or it's out of context, or whatever the case may be. And we typically stay out of it, and we typically are silent. I mean, if it were something horribly wrong, then we might have to correct it with the person who said it. But again, our, we provide information, and how it's used is really beyond our control. And that's pretty much our position. So we don't like to be misquoted. We don't like that. We don't necessarily like being quoted at all. Um, but we certainly are not engaging in any sort of ongoing discussion about that. And what are the sources of research that you typically rely on? What are, so the question is, what are the sources of research that we typically rely on? And I would say just about anything and everything. We get a lot of information from executive branch agencies. Um, especially when we're doing budget analyses and things like that. Um, a lot of state government information. Um, we subscribe to various research databases. Um, a lot of think tanks put out good stuff that we use for different purposes. I mean, obviously, we're, we're citing our sources and so forth. It really just depends on what, what is involved. All sorts of state agencies issue all sorts of reports for all sorts of things. I mean, you would never know how many statutes have a reporting provision in them where this agency or this authority or whatever has to issue a report every year, every other year, has to report on this action. This commission has to do this and report. We, our library is a repository for all those reports. So we get tons of information from all kinds of sources and again, we have professional researchers and we have professional re reference librarians who deal with all of that stuff. And some, some of the reports that we might use or might cite are actually on our website. So we might cite something the state auditor did. We might cite something that a, a, a former legislative committee did an issue, and that would be on our website as well. Yes? So since you are um, a bipartisan um, branch, we're a nonpartisan non agency. That So the question is, as a nonpartisan agency, do we have to make sure that the sources we use are nonpartisan? And the answer is, we certainly have to be careful about that. There are times when we will use sources that are more or less partisan than others, but we always say where we got it from. We don't say, you know, we don't just accept things blindly and don't say where it's from. In some cases, there may be research on a particular topic where I actually had an angry constituent phone call one day about this. Um, he was really upset that a fiscal estimate quoted some particular source on a particular issue. And when I said, I don't know why we quoted that source, I have to talk to the person who wrote the fiscal estimate, we talked, and pretty much that organization, which does have a, a leading, they would never say otherwise, was the only source that existed on that particular research topic. So we didn't say the fill in the direction leading organization said this. We said the name of the organization put out this research that said this. We weren't ignoring other sources. There simply weren't any other sources on this. And we were not necessarily exploring an area that was widely covered. It was some, some new topic where we had no way to estimate what would happen. So we used whatever was available. We didn't say it's definitive. We didn't say, we have this perfect answer based on it, but we cited it. So we are cognizant of that, and we try as much as possible to use government data when it's appropriate. Um, there are a lot of good research sources that are not partisan. We, um, one of the organizations I mentioned before is NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures. They do a lot of policy work and policy I'll call it accumulation, if you will. They will tell you what all 50 states are doing regarding a particular topic. So if we're, let's say, writing something about marijuana or whatever, let's say, we can call them and know, okay, here's data from all 50 states because they've accumulated that or, or compiled that, and we can use that in something that we're doing. And certain sources like that have a imprimatur, if you will, of they're being compiled for research purposes only. They're, the organization doesn't have a position on anything, really. So we tend to rely on those when we can and expand the reach depending on what the needs are. Hi. 
I think we have covered the, the waterfront on a lot of this. Really do want to appreciate, express our appreciation for all the detailed work that, that you've given us, all the detailed information. And it's been really opening, eye-opening on a part of the government that many of us did not know existed. So thank you. from the OLS there on the bench right by the back.